In this video, we're going to handle this infinite sum of signs with a cool technique making use of the special properties of complex numbers, specifically the properties of complex numbers in the context of trigonometry. Now you may be wondering why I'm bothering with this specific series, why demonstrate a cool complex number trick for evaluating this one instead of some other one, well, I selected this one because it's one that has a cool complex number trick that you can use to evaluate it. Not every sum you could dream up necessarily can be handled that way. So much like textbook problems, I picked this one because it's one of those that does have such a cool trick for doing it. Now before we get into any of the clever complex trigonometry stuff, it'll actually be useful to rewrite this infinite series of signs using summation notation to get this. All you have to do is notice that the integer multiplying the theta and all these sine functions goes up by one for each term, and that the number in the denominator of all these terms is just the sequence of positive odd integers, which we can write as 2n minus 1. And of course, with this definition of n, the series we started with was summed from n equals 1 to infinity, so we simply end up with that, as I already showed you. Now, a lot of people's instinct is to try and do this sum by inserting the Taylor series expansion for the sine function. The reason why this is a lot of people's instinct is because it's usually easier to handle a power series sum than a sum over an infinite series of transcendental functions like trig function. But this turns out not to be easier at all precisely because it does give you a double infinite sum an infinite sum of infinite sums, which in general is not easier to handle. In some cases, you can reverse the order in which you do the sums and it'll work out nicely, but this is not one of those cases. And it is true that the technique we are going to use to successfully sum this series works by converting it into an infinite power series, but it does so very differently. Now the trick we're going to make use of here, as is so often when you mix complex numbers in trigonometry, is based on off of Euler's formula. Now the key realization here is that the Euler formula tells us that the imaginary part of a complex exponential is actually just the sine function. Now this is important because we can take advantage of that fact to convert our sum of sines into an infinite power series, one that we actually can sum up. So with our infinite sum of signs written in summation notation, we can apply our knowledge of the Euler formula to write that as a power series. Notice how each of the terms in this power series is linearly dependent on a single sine function. Given that, we can use Euler's formula to rewrite the arbitrary sine function as the imaginary part of a complex exponential with otherwise the same argument, meaning we get this. And you can see that that's right immediately because if you just take the imaginary part of that complex exponential using the Euler formula, all you do is reproduce the signs that we had there before. But the cool thing about this is now that you've gotten the term under the sum written in terms of an exponential, you can use the rules of powers to rewrite it in a way that makes the sum much easier to do. Specifically, when you raise a quantity to a power that's already been raised to a power previously, the overall power on that thing is just the product of the two powers. Now you can use that property here in reverse very productively. Specifically, if you pull a factor of 2n out of the exponent, then what you're left with is an infinite power series in powers of e to the i theta over 2. Now this may seem like a strange thing to do. Why not just pull out n and write it as a power series in e to the i theta? why bother mess with the two, and the reason why really comes down to hindsight. Later on in the calculation, it turns out to be easier to figure out how to actually do the power series sum if you have that two pulled out. It's actually closer to something recognizable written that way. The next step we're going to perform is actually also exactly like that. It's another step where it's not exactly clear why we would need to do that. It's really just to get it into a more recognizable form where we only know to do this due to hindsight, really. It's just something we know works from having done it before. And this next step is factoring out a single factor of e to the i theta over 2 from the entire power series. This leaves the exponent in the power series 
equal to the quantity in the denominator. You'll see why that actually does make this power series easier to sum just by relation to known power series next. To make that process easier, it's useful to define a new variable. Specifically, we're going to set x equal to e to the i theta over 2. Making that substitution leaves our power series looking like this. And the reason why we're doing that is because we don't actually need to mess with the specific form of the e to the i theta over 2 variable until after we've completed the sum. So until that point, it's useful to just substitute x in to keep the notation cleaner. Looking at this power series carefully, we may recognize that it looks kind of similar to another power series that's very famous, specifically this logarithm power series. And it turns out this logarithm power series really is actually all we need to compute this sum, at least with a little cleverness. In fact, what we actually need are two corollary power series. The first of the two can be a obtained by simply multiplying the minus sign of the one we already have to the other side, giving us this. And the other one can be found by reversing the sign of x on the original power series we had, and that yields this. And if we also distribute the minus sign through, we arrive at this. It turns out that these two power series are actually the only two we need, and you can see that because if we add them together, we get this. And that is actually exactly the power series we wanted. So we have our key result. We now know how to sum that series exactly. So let's insert that in. Inserting it into our original function gives us this. At this point, the sum is done. And in order to complete the calculation, we need to reintroduce what x equaled e to the i theta over 2, back into this function we've been trying to compute, which gives us this. From here, we can then manipulate this into a form where the imaginary and the real part are clearly separated, and then we can just take the imaginary part and we're done. The first step is to multiply and divide the argument of the logarithm by e to the minus i theta over 2. If you distribute that through, you find that the numerator and the denominator of that argument are both proportional to trig functions. Recall these formulas for sine and cosine that follow from Euler's formula. Looking at our function, you see that the numerator is proportional to cosine and the denominator is proportional to sine. Specifically, the denominator is minus 2i sine and the numerator is 2 cosine. We can cancel the 2s stick the i in the numerator at the cost of the minus sign that's already there, and then write cosine over sine as cotangent, leaving us with this. From here, the next step is to separate that i out of the logarithm. We can use the property of the logarithm that a logarithm of a product is the sum of the logarithms of the factors to write it like this. And at this point, we're almost done. If we recall that the logarithm of i is equal to i pi over 2, then we arrive here. We can then use Euler's formula directly to write that complex exponential out front in terms of its real and imaginary part, leaving us with this. We can then multiply that out and isolate the real and imaginary part, and then just take the imaginary part and we have our final answer. It's really quite a beautiful result. It's very pretty in my opinion, and it's really surprising. Looking at the sum we started with, I would have never guessed that this is what it equals. Now with this done, you may ask the question, could we evaluate the same series but with cosines instead of sines using a similar trick? And the answer is yes. There's only a tiny change we actually need to make from what we've already done, and that is that we need to take the real part instead of the imaginary part. To see this, all you have to do is look back at Euler's formula. You see that the real part of a complex exponential is the cosine. So by picking the real part instead of the imaginary part of the complex series that we were dealing with in the middle of the last problem, you do generate what the cosine version of that same series equals. So if we make those slight alterations to our calculation, as I've done here, then we find that this is the result for the corresponding cosine series. So then altogether, our two key results from this video are these.
end screen. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. And also let me know what you think of this format. Uh, it's the first time I've tried it, so I didn't nail it perfectly. But regardless, I'm interested in knowing what you think about it. Dietrich out.